Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the eighth Pi Data TT Meetup. Today we have Chris Manohar. He's a PhD candidate from the UWI, and he'll be presenting on an introduction to recommender systems in Python. So be before we get into the presentation, I want to reiterate the Pi Data Code of Conduct. So be kind to others, do not insult or put down others, behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes and language are not appropriate for Pi Data. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate. Pi Data is dedicated to providing a harassment-free and a harassment-free event experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of participants in any form. Thank you for helping make this a welcome and friendly community for all. Chris, go ahead. Hi guys, um, I'm Chris Manahar from South Trinidad. So today I'll be doing um, a basic introduction to recommend the system. So this is a presentation I did before. So just to give you the theory and we'll focus more on the code. So I have some nice um, exercises where we'll go and take a deep dive into a um, Python library called Surprise uh, that's goes specifically to recommend the systems. And um, so we'll I'll go through that in detail, show you how to get it up and running with that on paper space, uh, how you can implement your own algorithm and so on. So just a quick primer, uh, I'll, I'll skip through these slides here. Um, I want to do more of the code stuff. So uh, just a quick primer on what recommend the systems are and the, the theory behind them. Right. Uh, we have so the first thing is well, why would you have these systems? Well, as we all know, we interact with recommended system daily, right? So from anything that Amazon suggests is what you should buy, you can search, you know, what apps in the store, and 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 it's a really uh, huge huge industry because it's the idea of trying. We have so many so many content and items compared to users. So getting access to relevant information is is now the the king, right? So the better that you can do this, um, you know, the better you could profile people, the better you could have targeted ads and so on. So this, this sort of idea of personalization um, on the whole is, is linked to, to recommend the systems, right? Um, and essentially the recommender problem is that we, we have um, way more items than there are users. So what are the most relevant um, information to this particular user, right? So we try to look, um, there are different approaches. So you have knowledge base, content base, Collaborative filtering and deep neural networks. So I'll just go briefly into the content and collaborative filtering and code. Um, we will we'll look at a collaborative implementation of a collaborative filtering um, algorithm. Right? So th th these are just different approaches to solving the same problem. Right? And um, the content based algorithm, what it does, it uses the, the item features that the user, so the information, all the information about the user, how they rate certain things, and it uses that to to sort of reorganize the, the, the items. So based on their preferences, right, what we do, we, we sort of normalize the scores. So, so if you have, uh, let's just say the example we have here is movies. So if you know this guy likes to watch uh, more fantasy movies versus comedy movies versus um, horror movies, right, then we, what we would do is that we would say, okay, we would now start to, to give um, movies that have horror ratings and fantasy ratings that are long weight. So we start to look at the entire item space from this person's point of view. So based on his content, uh, we now reorganize the whole item space. And then from that, we, we sort of select uh, what might be the next best things to, 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 to give to this user. So clearly it's, it's good for niche, right? So if we figure out that there's this niche that this person likes uh, based on his content, then, then we can quickly be able to, to search this, this, um, this space to be able to figure out what items we should um, deliver to this person. Of course, we look at things that they, they have not seen based on the history. And the flip side to that is that now, obviously, this is bad for discovering use, um, users' interests, right? So if we want to sort of expand their worldview and expose them to things that they actually may be interested in or they, they know that they're interested in, um, that this now would be a little bit challenging. This approach would be challenging. Right? Um, the other re restriction of this is that it usually requires domain knowledge um, to figure out what the item features are, because remember, that's what we're doing. We, we're letting the user sort of rate items based on certain features, and then we, we reorganize 
the items according to that, because from their ratings, we, we will get an idea of what they, they like. So the, the quick example that we use here, we have a bunch of movies and, and um, the features that just say are genres, right? And, and the, the system could be as complex as you need. So we are just keeping it simple to explain the ideas. Features could be anything, it could be uh, the length of time that you look at something, the number of skips, the number of rewatches, stuff like that. So, so any sort of information we can gather um, on the item with respect to the user. So um, in this case here, we just have the movies and we're looking at um, some basic genre as the feature. So if we have a particular user, and, and this is the ratings um, that, uh, that, that we would extract. So we say, okay, we know he looked at uh, how to train a dragon. So that means um, somebody took how to train a dragon and said, okay, how to train a dragon in our feature space maps the cartoon and comedy. And similarly, Fury would map the drama, Jumanji, the fantasy and comedy and so on. So if we know that these are the things that this user looked at, then we could sort of get a sense, um, just by looking at the, the data here, we could sort of get a sense that this guy likes stuff with fantasy and comedy because he tends to look at movies that, that have more, more of these um, characteristics, right? So how do we then reorganize all of the movies with respect to that? Is that, let's just say these were just the, the, the items that, that um, he had looked at, right? So these are the ratings that he, he gave for particular movies. So for this one particular movie, he gave it us, let's say six out of 10, and it was a comedy cartoon kind of thing. And let's just say he gave this other movie just a three and that was a drama. So this would indicate he doesn't really like the drama. So how do we, we, we work with that mathematically is that we would take um, these ratings and then we would multiply them by each of the features that are associated with that particular item and then we'll sum and then normalize. So essentially what we're doing is we're trying to dissect this user and sort of get a weighting for this user in terms of how much fantasy. So this user is like a recipe. So we're saying like this particular user, you know, he's probably two parts fantasy, one part drama, half part, um, one part cartoon, half part drama, and you know, the rest is comedy. So, you know, very more into comedy. So once we have these these sort of normalized weights, we can then reorganize the 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 um the item space now. Right, because where we all, all where we would have yeah, you, uh, a domain expert would have come in and said, okay, this movie is fantasy action. It's not just a weighting of one. We uh, we adjust those weighting now based on the, the normalized information of this user. So we are looking at these items from the, the viewpoint of this, this user, right? So from that now, we just simply sum across and then we would get an idea of the things that this user might like. So the, the one with the higher, higher number would indicate um, based on his content history, it would indicate that he is more likely to, to follow you know, a particular movie. And of course, we would then uh, you know, sort it and we take the top things that are not in the list because it doesn't make sense recommending something that somebody has already seen. Okay. And, and that's basically, in a nutshell, how content-based recommender systems work. They use the user history to then figure out the items for the features in the, and after the items, and then we reorganize the item space based on those weights. So the other type of algorithm that we uh, would discuss would be the collaborative filtering um, uh, algorithm. So what they do is that they take into consideration all of the all of the information that we have from everybody. So each user now would then have a rating for a particular um, item, right? So in this case, a movie. So they would rate the movie one over 10, one over five, or whatever scale that we use. Right. And once we have this rating information for everybody, we would then try to, to learn patterns from that. So then what we would do is we would plot the users and the items into what we call a latent feature space. Right. And what that would do is we're trying to bring the two things together. Right. Because it, 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 in order to form some sort of um, comparison to say, okay, this person is close to this movie or this person is like this other person, we need to bring them into the same, same domain in order to compare them. So that's what these, these algorithms do. They would take this user item interaction matrix and then they try to, to bring it into a single latent space. Right? And you have different approaches to doing that. Um, you know, alternative squares, SPD, we use um, uh, stochastic gradient descent or any of these things um, to sort of learn that information. And once we learn that information, uh, then we can do a user to user um, filtering. So we can say, okay, who are all the users that are closest to me? Using some usually using cosine distance or some other metric, right? And then who are all the items closer to me, or which items are closer to whatever. So once we're on the same plane, um, we can then do these comparisons. So why that's nice is because it exploits the similar similarity between users and items, and not just 
this one particular user, but all of the users simultaneously. And because of that, now we are able to have this, this uh, idea of serendipity where we can look at the global information and we can see who are the people that you are like, and then look at the things that they like that you don't. And then it's chances are because you are close to these people, there's a good chance that you would also like these things. So this is where a uh, disadvantage of the content base uh, approach doesn't have is that we cannot do this sort of extension of, of growth and you know expansion of uh, our users will be. But we can do this with the, with the content filtering, um, uh, collab sorry, collaborative filtering uh, type systems, right? So mathematically, how would that look? We would have our uh, user item matrix. So here, the classical example of using the chairs movies are uh, the free code. We uh, there's a nice blog post that I saw that I had modeled the, the code session kind of, so where we did books, right? But I mean, it's all of the same. It's just you know some user and some item. So it doesn't really matter once the, once the weight is there. So once we have this item matrix, then we would um we would decompose this into some some latent feature space. And usually this would be um, the number of features here to be learned will be would be less than um, the minimum of the users and the number of, number of items. So it's also a sort of a form of data compression. Um, right. Uh, so what we do is we we'll use some algorithm such that if we if we extract this, this um we'll call user embedded and items embedded, and then we multiply them back together, we should get an approximation of this user item matrix. So if we if we are good at that. Then what that, that tell us that tells us that this this um user embedding and item embedding when they interact together gives us back what we observe. So based on that, if it's really close or good enough at least, um, it means then we can trust the predictions for things that this user did not create as yet. So for example, user four didn't create movie three, right? So once we are satisfied with these user and items embeddings, we can then make a prediction for what this would be, and then based on that. Uh, we so you think about this user now. We would then get all of the movies, all of the predictions for movies that he has not seen, and then um, we can then uh, recommend those to him. Or we can we could do all sorts of things. Because remember, we're all in the same space now. I can then look for people that are similar to this guy, right? Um, and maybe have a certain number of movies that I didn't see. So if I want to look to to explore, right? So I can find those people, and then use that information to recommend movies. So say okay, based on these people. These are the set of movies that are popular amongst those those guys, and those, they take the average rating, and that might be my rating, and then sort those unknown movies to me. But the it's not just about that. That approach doesn't give us this unknown stuff. It gives us unknown stuff that I am has a high probability of liking because people close to me like these things. So we can do user to user, item to item, user to item, and you can get as creative as you want. Because once you have this decomposition, um, you know we we can then started to make use of those different features um, and those, those embeddings to, to, to make the recommendation, right? So usually this is the one of the more popular algorithms, uh, class of algorithms, right? And the, the um, deep neural net type stuff would then combine. So you would take like information from the content based side, collaborative side, and any other type of features that you might observe and you feel as a neural net and then hope for that to learn the patterns as well. Um, that's it in a nutshell. So the types of algorithms that they would use are usually in literature. Um, uh, this is decomposition of the one, so they tend to use um, uh, SVD. So another thing that you could do is also, uh, this is the optimization problem. So we want to get the, the predictions. Uh, this is what we have. So we're taking the difference between them. And we just want to sort of minimize the, the least squared error uh, between that, right? So you can learn that through SVD, um, stochastic gradient descent, alternating least squares. These are all different types of algorithms to, to, to figure out what that, that embedding would be, right? Um, so the stochastic gradient descent is flexible, it's easily parallelizable, but it's usually slow to converge and doesn't handle sparse data well. So that's another thing about this, these recommended systems. They are usually way more items than they are users, right? And, oh, and even if they, are, if they are sort of relatively approximate, it's unlikely that each user has a rating for all items. So the data is usually quite sparse. Right, so sometimes that poses a problem in terms of how, how the algorithms would deal with that. Right, um, alternating least squares, it's a, it's, it has a parallel. It's usually faster than bridge, and it's usually specify, um, specialized for these types of least squares problems. So, um, you know, this is a, so like in the surprise library, um, they would use um, ALS or, uh, once the the data is is not too sparse. Um, it, it would default to using uh, a ALS 
to uh, approach to, to the, the um, user embedded and the item embedded in it, right? Um, which could, uh, mainly because this is sort of specialized for for all the um, police vessel. Right. Um, all right. So that's just some of the theory. All right. So I think I'll stop here. So the hybrid I mentioned would um, come in, um, combine all the different things, put it in your network, and then try to do the parts of it. So these are the references that I use for the theory side. So now we're going into the to the paper space side of things, which is really cool. Um, and this is the link to the GitHub. So I'll post it in the chat uh, for the tutorial that I have. Right. Um, and then we I'll proceed to, to go through the surprise. Surprise it. Um, sorry, let me do the library. So uh this this surprise level is, is uh what we what we use on it's pretty pretty good. They, they have a very nice framework set up for uh how to do recommender systems. All right, so I'll post that here for you. So Get that. So if you have a paper space account, um, I think in Torian's talk, we was able to get access to some stuff there. So if you have a paper space, you could just log in, right? And then we want to do is we create our rapids. All right, so we could call this by the biggest, because I already had one up. Uh, great. Uh, or feel free to stop me and ask if you have any questions. Yeah. Rapids, right? I guess we could go. Uh, yeah, we could go with a P. Let's go with P5. I don't know what it should be enough. All right, so and then you just pull in the Git. All right, so the link that I post in there. Um, yeah. All right, so this would pull in the, the repo and the tutorial that I have. Up. Right, and then we start with it. Right, so so paper space is pretty cool. Um, I've been playing around with it since the, the last it was introduced in the last couple of five data talks. So for those who don't know, um I, I'm sure you're probably familiar with sites like um uh digital ocean and, and and Amazon that would be able to spin up VMs in the in the cloud. So this is is sort of like that, but it's specialized for machine learning. So the VMs that we we spin up here, yeah, the idea is that it has all of the things that required to do whatever machine learning uh, tasks that you want already built in, and you are able to use make use of the some very powerful GPUs under the hood, and you, you could sort of you know just just spin this up, run your run your stuff, get get your get your your models, download it, and, and take it off, right? And there's also a deploy framework which I was, didn't get a chance to play with yet. Um, but in that framework, uh, you could actually set up um, a pipeline and how to send, send something to production um, through, through using this paper space VM. And right, so here, so we're just waiting um, for this stuff. So while this is spinning up, you guys have any questions so far? Now I'm gonna stick with mine. Why is Fury not an action movie? <laughs> that's I, that's I probably missed that. Uh, that's it. So that's another. That's a good point. That's another disadvantage of um, uh, the con the content base is because it relies on the domain expert. So usually, if you know the expert makes a mistake, then you know that that sort of pollutes the data. <laughs> it's your fault, man. Yeah. Hey, hey, what's up with paper space, man? It's just it's a it's a bit faster. Oh man, I, I usually have mine set up before the talk, but um, I, I have I actually have I have one set up, but I, I sort of wanted to, you know, do things like that. But anyways, yeah, I, I guess I could do that. I could probably just start start the other one. What's up? Let me just. All right, so, um, oh, no, hey, this came up. Okay, nice. So I can read this. Uh, I'll put it there we go. All right, so anyway, so that's, 
So uh, just to kind of show your own space, so you could do sort of like a little terminal thing. Um, so you, you have access, you could install whatever, you know, push, um, you know, you would, so it's really, really flexible. So you could bring in this here, do your stuff online, and when you're ready, just push it back to your repo. Um, so you don't even need like, you know, you need like a computer to do this kind of work, right? Everything is on Google. So we're gonna just run through the Jupyter, um, and they have their own um, sort of Jupyter-like thing on, on the inside as well. But I, I just use the normal. So if you the link that I sent you there, we'll be using. I already have the data and everything set up here, so we'll be using these um, these book ratings uh, from this from a cargo competition, right? Um, so we'll be using that. We do recommend recommendation. All right, so there's a link here for the data set. So uh, first we just import normal stuff, and then we'll bring in the, uh, we're just reading the, the ratings data, and the metadata will be used later on uh, when we actually do the actual recommendation. Right, um, so we just sort of pull that in. All right, so then now we create the surprise data set. So I just have some, um, I'll clean this code a little bit up, but I just have some error checks. Uh, so in case it, you know, it's not, so I don't think surprises is default in the environment yet, but you can set up a VM with everything that you like, and then you just um, push that to Docker, and you can pull that in through the paper space if you know. But anyway, so we just do a check here. If surprise is not there, um, we just sort of install it. So you could pip or condor, but it's on condor, so I'll just pull it in there, right? And then when that is finished, uh, what we'll do is we'll create a reader. So the the reader, um, the idea of this um this reader abstraction that that um surprise has is that it would read data from a raw source, but the source must just have these three things only it, and it must be in this order, right? So if you're doing it for your own work, uh, you need to organize. So you could put in your, your file, your data, whoever, but the information that you feed in into um, the, the information that you feed in into the, the, the surprise library, it, it must be user ID. So the, the identifier or the key for the user Followed by the book ID, or in this case, the item ID, which is books, followed by the ratings, right? So the CD IDs are just numbers, but these could be names, what it doesn't matter once it's unique, right? Once it's unique, so identify that item. Because what surprise would do, it would take this and it would map it into an internal identifier on this one, right? And then, of course, you rate it, right? And so you pass in. So they have a reader class, and here you can define the the, the the scale of your rating. So one to five, or if you if you if one to five is not work, or one to ten, or any any range that, that you like, uh you just sort of specify that there and then just would um read in everything, um read in everything for you. Right. So once we have that, um then we have read in our data. So you can think about this as we setting up that matrix that we had here. The users on one side, the items on one side, and the rating. So that that would be what this is here. So it's, it's not like in matrix form, but the information is there. And surprise would, would be able to, to, to access it, right? Um, so once we have that now, it's literally as easy as this here. You just define which algorithm you would like to, to run and, and you, you you just 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 hit run, right? It does cross-validation, everything for you under the hood. So you don't have to worry about any of that stuff, right? So we just, okay, we want to go with SVD. You could set the number of epochs, right? So we just instantiate. So pull, pull any stuff from the library. Uh, we just instantiate what we like. Tell, okay, hey, give me the data for cross-validate uh, using SVD. This is the information that I pulled in, our matrix that we want to, to get the use an item embeddings for. Uh, you know, just root mean square uh, error for now. You could set the how many cross-validations you want and, and do this. So, so this matrix is actually pretty dense, right? Um, so, you know, it, it usually takes a, a little longer than usual to, to run. Usually, because um, like some of the other um, work I did, uh, the matrix is a lot, lot sparser. So, it, you know, it, it usually trains in like seconds, right? Um, so this one is a little bit more dense, so it take, takes a little while. So each of these epochs is, is unique training. And the nice thing about this here, as you'll show, I'll show you later on, it's very easy to compare several algorithms. So it's, it's, just, it's just like this. You could just say four, an algorithm in here, create our instances, and we just use, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I didn't get to, to hook it up with that yet. Um, so, uh, yeah, but you can scale out, right? So, and the point is when you finish, um, you get this nice, this nice readout here, 
right? And it does all of the calculations for you, everything. So it's a really, really nice pipeline. Um, I really, really enjoy this library. And the, the documentation is quite, it's really self-documented because I mean, the, the, the actual docs a little bit, um, I, I, I mean, they could have a little bit more verbose, but the code is really well written. So you, you could you just jump into the Git and it's easy to follow what it is. All right, so here you see the different folds, you get your, your average stuff, you get your standard deviation, all of that, and you're good to go, all right? Um, so once you have that, now you're ready to predict. So what we did here, what so you can keep playing around with this, um, and, and, and I'll show you this now where you can extend the class, right? Um, and you can override the predict method and so on, the estimate method. So you can play with your algorithm until you get something that you like. But once you find something that you like and you're ready to push into production, you would want to use all of the data that you have, right? Because remember for these folds, um, yeah, you could actually set the percentages and so on. I think the default is 25. Um, but anyway, so all of these these holes, what it would do, it would do the, the training set, test set thing um, set up for you, right? And you get the time to train and so on. But once once you're satisfied with this, right, um, you know, root means square less than one. So, you know, we, we're good enough for now, right? It was, um, uh, we just run it on the, the entire data set. So this is a method that took me a while to find. Right, because uh, what I did before I actually got and recreated uh, a full data set from scratch, but you could actually use the data set that you pulled in and you just called build full training set. And what it would do is um, it would take all of the information and, and convert it into the training set form that then you can just pass into your algorithm. Right, so you do that. That's what this does here, converts all of it and then trains the, the SVD with it. So this will now be um, learning those latent features using all of the information that we have. And once we have that, um, then we can go ahead and just make predictions, right? So um, once we once we have that set up there, uh, it's just as easy as calling the predict method, passing or what prediction you would like. So if you want to know for the this particular item and user, now these are the 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 item IDs and the user IDs uh, that people um, that surprise would have used, right? So um, internally. It says item 10 and uh, sorry, user 10 and item 100. But I'll show you how we can do this mapping between you. So, what they call the raw user ID is what we passed in. And then they have um, what they call UID, the inner UID, that's what they're using. So, they, they would have a, a dictionary that does that mapping for you. And they have some nice wrapper functions. So, you can expose to your users the ID that they are custom with, like their, their username or something, for example, if that's unique or their email or something. Right, and then you can take that now, map it into the internal ID, and then then make a prediction. But after that, to predict is as simple as you just pop say which user, which item, and we get an estimation. Um, so for this particular book, for this user, we say okay, uh, that's that's about four, a rating of four, right? Um. So if we want to do this, um, have more control over doing these mappings between users, the internal and external IDs. Right, um, the training set has a method uh, built in. So two raw um, would take the number that is the internal UID and give you back what that is. So for example, internally, surprise would say uh, 10, but what 10 really refers to is this particular user ID, because this user ID would have come from the book data, right? Um, I mean, it'll be sequential. It could be because you're in a database, you may not have all of the information for all of the users. So you'll have skips in the unique identifiers from your from your application. So this is just a mapping from your IDs to the to the to the IDs of surprise. Right. And then similarly for the item, similar method. So once we have have this here trained, right? Um, and we have inside of the SVD algorithm, we would have the the, the matrix and user embeddings, we can then use that to do whatever custom predictions that we like. So when we say custom predictions, it means how do we then do the recommendation? Do we do we just say, okay, um, give me all of the predictions for all of the items of this user and sort it? Or do I and take pick the top 10? Or or do I look for items, or find the most popular items for this user, find the items that are closest to this, so that'll be like an item to item, and then recommend those? Or do I look for people that are similar to me and then use some, some features of those people to determine what to recommend? It's up to you uh, at this point. Um, so based on the problem that you have and what you're trying to do uh, with those mappings, um, you, you would then take that information and, and, and write your own algorithms, right? Um, so here we just, well, let's add a, a little quote to show you. So put it in here, 
But if you want to extract, so the each of these algorithms now internally, uh, depending on what you use, they, they would store their user item embedded in some way. So like, for example, with the SVD algorithm, it stores it in this um, PU matrix, right? So if I pass in this particular UID, I would be able to get user embedded. So after training for this particular user 10, right, which maps on to this guy, 53997, this would be his um his vector, right? Uh, his his latent feature vector, right? And then this is the item feature vector for the corresponding um item that we have here is one hundred. So then all you're doing now is that these are points in in a dimensional space. So all we're doing now is just trying to figure out which points do we want closer together. So this is where you do your your custom filtering, right? Um, based on whatever. So the usual, um, under the hood, usual machine learning stuff, you have your biases. You also have your regularization parameters and so on that you can set, right? So the docs show you how you can set those things, right? Um, but for now, uh, you could just uh, extract the bias, the default biases that they have for this particular user, right? Um, so if we, if we get a global mean, right? Um, so there are a bunch of uh, characteristic functions we can do. And then based on that, what we could do is we could reconstruct a, a basic estimate um, uh, for, for this particular uh, rating that we would like. So we would like to get a rating for, for this user for item um, 101. So all we need to do now is do the dot product between this item, this user embedding and this item embedding, right? But remember um, how the machine learning would have done, it would have normalized the information first Right, and then it would have had your biases to make sure it is not overfitted. So in order to reconstruct that, uh, we just have to do things in reverse, right? So that's why we need to get the global mean, right? Because everything would have been normalized that, and then we add in the biases, and then then the dot product. So we take the dot product between these two embeddings, add in the biases and the mean, just to reverse it, and then we get the estimation, right? Uh, uh you oh, oh, probably didn't run this. You wrecked already. All right, there we go. Right, so uh, we, we got this this prediction. So, and this is us using our custom algorithm, which is just a, a you know a basic, you know, give me the rating. Is the item is the is the user multiply? Give me the rating, which is pretty close to the default prediction that the SVD would have used because the SVD I think it gave. Um, where else did it give four point something? Yeah, we gave four, uh, and and just using this this basic algorithm here, we give um three point nine six. So it's pretty good, right? Um, so so that's the prediction. So once we have the predictions, then we can do custom recommendations, right? So uh, what we would do uh for these recommendations, um, since the uh the tutorial I was following. Uh, just sort of to demonstrate a, a technique. Uh, what it did was it looked for, for if, you, if you're interested in, in recommendations for a particular for a particular user, it tried to find books that are closer together based on their titles, right? And uh, so it uses um, library um, Diffler, which is really cool to, to, to uh, give you that sort of um, ranking. So if you have a bunch of text, uh, you could use that to, to say how close uh, these two texts are uh, together. So it, it just uh, sort of did a quick and dirty thing like that. Um, so based on the book title, uh, you would want to get the titles that are closest to it, all right, which is what it would call here. And then um, they just sort of return the to, um, the book ID itself. So it was a sort of a, uh, you know, a, ch a cheap way, I guess, of um, of, of finding the, the book ID within the, the data that was supplied to the user. But what you could have done alternatively was you could have had all of these uh, closest titles that you would have here, and then return that as an array, and then um, and do some clustering based on those, right? So again, at this point, here, everything is custom, and it really sort of has to fit your problem. Just for the tutorial, uh, for now, they just sort of uh, use this method to figure out what is the book ID um, for the for, for the particular title um, within the data set that was originally given. And then once we once we have that, we can then link that to the metadata. So we can then pull up that information and then do the prediction for the reviewer. Uh, to do a review uh, prediction, what we would then do is that we would say, okay, take this user ID, book title, and we have our model and the metadata here. 
And what we would do is we look up, get the book ID inside, then we pass that in um, to our prediction method. So this model could be anything, could be, could be any other type of algorithm. And we get the prediction for that review, and then we just retain the estimate. Because when we call the predictor method, uh, prediction method, remember, that returns um, under the hood uh, uh, object here where we have this estimate here, right? And you could attach, I'll show you just now when you could, when you um, could extend and put in your own user framework and put in your own algorithm, you could define what this object is that is returned, right? Um, so the SVD implementation, and most of them follow this pattern where they will have the, uh, they will at least have this information and you could append, meaning the user ID, the item ID, uh, whether it was impossible to find it or not, depending on the algorithm that you're using and um, uh, the estimation. So, so in that case here, um, that method would just return the estimate. So this is just a quick and dirty way of, of um, some helper methods to, to get a particular prediction for a, a user and a book title, right? And, and once we have that there, right? Uh, once we have that there, now we could generate a recommendation for that particular a particular user, right? So we could set a threshold to say, okay, we only want to recommend books for this user that are above a certain rating, right? So here is where you could do your filtering. You could um, only want to recommend books uh, from users that are sufficiently close to this person, however you want it. So here's like the high level entry point to your custom recommendation, right? Um, so in this case, uh, what, what it did was it just sort of looked through all the books and anything that, that was above the threshold um or four we we just say we're going to recommend that right um in this iteration they just did the first one and then we could extend it to give it like the top k if you like right um so once we have the model and metadata the id of the user we're interested in um so it will run a little slow because it's basically an exhaustive search right um so i mean in, in reality you won't really do something like this uh you would do something a little more optimized but again it's just to sort of demonstrate the flexibility of the that we're looking at here, right? So, so based on that, this is the first, um, this is the first book that came up, and and you could randomize it. I think they do a random shuffle, so you could sort of get a different, a different recommendation each time, right? Uh, but this is the first book that had a rating of more than four uh, for this particular, particular user. So, if you want to do it for K people, um, you know, you just do more of the same, and you just keep track of um, the top K, right? So, of course, this would run pretty slow. Uh, because it has to go through all of the um, all of the all of the items, right? So if we, if we run that there, it'll take a little while, and we get the top. In this case, the top five. Right? So, so once so 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 that's a, the so you could use the general framework uh, to get the things done. So we took you through setting things up mapping your custom data into the standard, the format that Surprise expects, then how you actually use the framework to do the predictions. You can dig under the hood in the algorithm to get the embeddings. And then once you have that, you can then do your custom recommendations. So, so what about if you want to do your own custom algorithms? It's really, really, really easy to do your own thing. Um, they have this alg algo -based, um class defined that does a lot of the grunt work for you. So the only thing you really need to specify is the estimate and the fit methods. Right, so in this particular, just a sort of illustrate the concept, all we're doing is um, where for our, our fit, we're just gonna get a global mean and our recommendation is just gonna be the global mean for that, for everything. Our, our answer is the same thing, just, just a global mean, right? Um, but you can see here now is where you could do your own thing based on the data, right? Um, and the algo-based class would handle a lot of the, the grunt work of keeping track of the the mappings between the user ID, the raw user ID, and the internal user IDs, and um, setting up all of that pipeline stuff and things for you. So all you need to do is just call the the super super class methods. So you call algo base in it, and you're good to go. And similarly, uh, the same pattern follows. If you go to use the fit, you just call the fit method that would handle the setup for you, and then you go ahead and do your thing, right? And the estimate you just return your answer based on the user and the ID. So once you once you have that defined there, yeah, uh, it's just as simple to group, to bring it into the framework. Uh, you need only just same as before. You just create your uh, instance of your own algorithm, pass it in, and, and you're you're off to the races, right? Um, so of course this would take a little um a, a little while to run because you know um 
if you get to go through all, all of the methods, all of these things like both. All right, I think the, the default here is five. Um, so while that's running, um, you could then use this this uh this sort of this sort of style to right. So we get the, the same thing. So compare to so see, it's not too bad. I mean, 0.98 versus 0.8. Um, <laughs> right. So just just the global average alone is is, is a root mean squared less than one. So you know, not too bad. Standard deviation, pretty low. Right. Um. So. So anyway, so if you want to combine now, uh, and it's really free because why, why, why I like it, because it's really easy now to set up experiments. Because if you want to compare against different um, different types of approaches and different types of predictions and stuff, you just it's, it's just as simple as this. You just create an array of your instances, algorithm, and then you do, do the same thing. Well, cross-validate, you get the information, you can do your full train on your data set, or if you have your own custom train and test set or whatever you want, you do that there. And then this is just um, a little bit of code to set up a pandas data frame with the results for you, right? So if you run it, uh, you should get something like this here, right? And you could sort sort it um, for the, the lowest value at the top or whatever. Right? So in this case, the SVD is still better than the my algorithm when you run. So so that's how you could uh, plug into the framework, right? And, and it really takes you end to end, right? And in very very few little lines of code, the only thing you have to do is really just supply supply this. But yeah, all the other type of what is, is once you stick to the APIs, you know, it's really, really easy to um to just you know run and forget and, and it works. Right. So this is it, it does a really nice job of having you to just focus on your algorithm to do the um, recommendation. So now um we'll do something a little fancy and tied into the dashboard. So this is all well and good. Uh you know, but we, we like to see see this in action. So um this important some libraries here. Um, uh, to to help work with the data, and then of course we need Jupyter Dash, right? Um, so we bring that in there, and what we're gonna do with this this um Jupyter Dash is just gonna set up a, a very simple um drop down where based on the drop down you select the the raw user ID, and then internally uh what would happen here is that uh we would map this this user ID to the username. Right, and then um, once we once we have that, uh, we can then all put that to the screen, right? Uh, what the particular username? Because the we well, set up the dictionary here, uh, put this drop down here, right? Which would pull from the options here, and what that would do is it'll go through the training set, and this is the internal dictionary that keeps the mapping between the raw and the user and the inner user IDs. So what we're doing is just creating a dictionary where the label that the user sees is the the ID that they are custom with, and then the the value that would be would be the internal ID of um of surprise. Now you didn't need to do this. I saw this the other quick and dirty, um, but you, you could have just had this um uh, supply the 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 raw the raw user ID to your dashboard, and then you could go look it up yourself afterwards if you like, right? Um, so this just defines the data for that drop down, right? Uh, here we just creating our app. We creating the the drop down element. Right, put it in the div, give it a name, all of that stuff, set up the values. So it will have all of that data there. This is dash table. We're going to just use to display the information. So initially, what we would do, we would have a default user of, say, a thousand, right? Um, and then we would, we would probably just get the recommendations for him. So we generate the top, top uh, five recommendations for this guy, put it in the pandas frame, and send it off to the table, right? So once we have the table here, this is just the code to. The generic code to, to run to display the table. And then once you once you have those elements defined, you put them in the array and add a tail layout. And, and, and literally that's it. You don't have to mess with no CSS, nothing like that. So I really, I really love this this dash thing. So you just sort of focus on your code yeah, and you could put up a nice it's plot, plotly dash, right? And you could put up a nice um a nice little UI. The only thing um to uh, kind of wrap your head around is the callbacks, right? So how it works. Is uh, with the callbacks you define what would be the the element that would be triggered when um, that this callback would be triggered for. So in this case, we are saying for the input, uh, the input would be this demo drop down, right? And the value that would be passed in the, the, uh, would be the property value, right? So we notice that the property value would be the inner IDs, right? Um, so is so what we do, we're telling Dash to do, we say okay. Uh, add a listener essentially to this particular 
HTML element. And whenever that is clicked, uh, what we want to do is fire this callback. And when we fire this callback, what am I expecting to give you is two sets of outputs. And I want you to update two sets of um, HTML elements that we defined, right? So we had the, the, the container, um, or oh, I, I, I lost over that. The container is just a, a piece of text um, that I defined to say, okay, you, this is your recommendation for whatever user. So that's the, yeah, look at here, there's, there's this div here, right? So it's okay, we wanna update this, this div and the children element um, with whatever value I return. And then of course I want to update the table, which would be our dash table uh, and the data property with the data that I set. So you, the dash table I think takes a dictionary in the records form. So once we have the data frame, uh, we will just call the, the, the two dictionary method to convert that into um, a, a record format for the, uh, for, for that dictionary. Um, sorry, take the pandas data frame and convert that uh, dictionary in records format, which the dash table would then use to update the data property, right? And all of the UI stuff, all of the hooks, all of that stuff handled for you. All right, so there's some code that I stole from Torian so just for um from his file data talk to, to show the 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 you know, clickable link. And then of course we just run the server. All right. And that's really all you really need to do to to have a, a nice UI. I mean you could you could put style sheets. Um the the dash the plot the dash gallery has really, really nice stuff. Um so you, you really just proof of concepts and, and you're off to the races, right? So Bam. Right, so we have your recommendations here. And remember what this uses, this using stuff from the, the user item embedded from our algorithm. So all of this thing here is, is behind the scenes, right? And you know, most of this was just from the from the surprise library. Um, the only custom code you really had to write was just what you would be concerned about and how you do the recommendations. And then you could hook it up it up with plot the dash so it becomes okay i want to get the recommendation for that particular user here so it'll take a little while to, to update because again we sort of do an exhaustive search right um yeah so just give it a moment to update all right then well yeah it, it'll update to it <laughs> ah there we go nice so then we we get the stuff Yes, Dorian, yes. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you want to go into production and scale and stuff like that, right? Because remember, this is the second day. So I think it's 50,000 entries or 100,000 or something like that, right? But these, these recommender things, um, they usually pull the patterns from, from very large amounts of data. It's talking like millions of items, like millions of users. So definitely you would have to use um, some more efficient code. And yeah, run it on rapid, paralyze the algorithms and so on. So that's why in the theory, you know, certain algorithms you may want to choose so you could take advantage of parallel architecture to, to get the things to run fast. Right. And you, this is something you would update periodically. So once you have the item you the item embeddings, uh, you know, you just sort of run your your custom predictions on that and then you update that in the background. Um as well. I guess if you're Amazon, you probably update that. If you're not that you probably update that really. Right, um, to capture the, the new information. Yeah, also, there's a lot of interesting research, um, uh, where they try to reverse from them, right? Because it's really, really sparse. How then do we get good, good recommendations? And then, how do you do sort of online updates of the, the embedded space and so on? So, there's a lot of literature that looks uh, around um, the computational challenges for this particular problem. All right, so, uh, well, that's it there for me. I'll explain any questions.